Okay, so welcome to your major specific uh, video chat this morning um, for undeclared engineering students. Um, as you've probably seen in my emails and if you've watched the videos with me, you know that I feel that undeclared engineering, there are definitely some very safe classes for you to take if you're one of those students who's um, really deciding what you want to do. Um, however, um, we keep it very general, so you might also be a student where there are some classes you should take that I'm not recommending, um, which is why I'll always say um, this is a very general guide and also, um, you know, I, I strongly encourage you to attend one-on-one -on -one appointments with me so that way we can make sure that you are um, getting the attention for your, your first semester of college that we um, want to give it. All right, so... Um, as you probably know at this point, I'm Kristen Bergen. I'm your academic advisor um, for Undeclared Engineering. Uh, this makes me the jack of all trades. I know a lot about every single major. I cannot get you into those upper level courses, um, but I can certainly get you through your first two years very well. Um, and it also means that I kind of have my foot in all the different departments as well. So it, it gives us an opportunity to really explore all those majors that you're interested in, um, whether it is talking to the other SOE hub advisor, which I always encourage you to do, um, or if it is, um, you know, speaking to faculty or upper class students in the majors you're interested in. Um, and as you as you probably read with Industry Hour, you're going to get to know uh, alumni in these in these areas as well. Um, outside of school, I do live in Troy, New York, um, so I'm local to the Capital Region. I'm a huge fan of Troy, New York um, and the Capital Region. Uh, you can get a really good dose of the urban lifestyle and, you know, walk around. You know, we have many different cities here and they all have a different personality. You know, we have Albany and Schenectady and Troy. Um, we also have beautiful towns like Saratoga and we're really close to both the Catskill Mountains and the Adirondacks. So it's a really good mix of um, that city and um, country living, which is great for me because I'm from Cooperstown, New York. So I love <laughs> to be able to get into the country and see trees and nature every once in a while. Um, you know, and it also means that I, I am a good person to chat to about Central New York if you have if you have any questions about that part of coming to RPI if you're not from the area. Um, also outside of school, I'm an avid reader. I love to write. I love to draw. Um, I have just started um, volunteering for a local animal organization that supports animals in need. Um, I have two cats of my own. <laughs> I used to have a hedgehog. Um, and shortly we're going to be fostering a couple of kittens, which will be really fun. And I'm sure you guys will hear all about it. Um, anyway, so that's me. Um, and just a reminder, I, I'm so happy to answer all questions that you have today. Um, throw them in the chat and I will get to all of them at the end. We'll have a nice uh, Q&A uh, sec session so that I can answer questions. Um, and during that time, I'm sure more things will occur to you in terms of questions. So we can cover those as well. There'll, there'll be plenty of time for you to think about, you know, everything you want answered. Okay. So today, this is the stuff that we're really going to cover. So I'm moving into this with the um, assumption that you did look over your registration guide. Um, so just so you know, I'll, I'll be talking about that a lot today and kind of where we find the answers in the guide. Um, so we're going to start with academic advising in the hub. We're going to talk about your your schedule for the fall semester. Um, we're going to talk about the registration resources that you really want to kind of have a handle on by the end of this week. So on Monday, you feel really confident with planning your schedule or registering for your schedule rather because we're there now. Um, and then, of course, as mentioned, we're going to have time for questions. Oops. Hold on. Okay. So academic advising in every single school in at RPI, it is a little bit different. Um, every school does have a hub, which is great because it means there is a good point person for all of our questions outside of the School of Engineering. Um, so I know that there are definitely going to be some of you who are considering an engineering major versus like a science major. Um, so what I can do is help connect you to those other schools so you can really talk about um, the curriculum 
uh, that, you know, maybe computer science has and how we can also think about it as we plan our schedules uh, while you're making a decision. Um, in the School of Engineering, we have a pretty unique way of doing it. So the first thing that happens is that you will get me um, and the SOE hub to be your primary resource as an academic advisor. Um, we really help you get your feet on the ground and make sure that you, um, you know, you minimally know how to find answers before you leave us. So a lot of what you and I will do together is make sure you're confident with all of the resources that are available to you um, and that you'll never find yourself in a situation where you just don't know where to go for an answer. You'll always have a direction. Um, once you, so as an undeclared engineer, once you declare your major, you will absolutely make a first stop with the SOE hub advisor of that major. Um, so you'll still have the chance to meet with a first year advisor to uh, make sure that you're getting that basic information on your major before you head up to your faculty advisor. Um, so you do not have to declare your major until your uh, first semester of your sophomore year. So basically like a whole year from now and then some. Um, so even if you as a sophomore declare your major, you will still make a pit stop with an SOE Hub advisor um, who will then make sure that you're all set with what we call the four year plan um, and then pass you off uh, to our partners in faculty advising and they are faculty advisors. Um, I will send these slides out at the end of this so that you can really kind of dig into these bullet points a little bit more if you would like to. Um, but as a very basic level in the hub, you know, what you and I will do, of course, is do everything we can to help you pick your major you will create a four-year plan. There's no such thing as a four-year plan, so it will be something, it'll be a document that you uh, you go to every semester, um, and it is going to be a complete layout of every semester from now until graduation to ensure that you know what all your requirements are for graduation, um, and you have a good idea of what else you could fit into your four years, you know, like an extra, um, internship or an extra, you know, um, you know, you have a little bit of space to maybe do research, all that kind of stuff. Um, once we get your feet on the ground in the hub, then you go to your faculty advisor, as mentioned, and that's where, you know, the real fun kind of gets started, where they're there to help you connect your education to your career goals. Um, so that might be, you know, helping you with your professional networking. That could be connecting you to co-ops and internships or research opportunities. Um, it is just the talking about what you can do with your career, because in every major, there's a lot of different directions you can take your degree, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll start talking about that, you and I. Um, um, before you get up there, just so you're you're confident in declaring your major. Um, but they really, you know, think of that tagline for your faculty advisors, connecting education to your career goals. Um, so that'll be, you know, your sophomore year to senior year, oh, and, you know, beyond. Sometimes you build a mentorship that lasts for a very long time. Okay. Um, so this is the team in the hub. Um, you can see me right there in the middle with red hair. My hair has changed a lot this year. Um, some of you may have noticed I have had pink and teal and blue. Um, I am blonde again. Um, <laughs> so who knows what I'll be the next time you see me. Um, but my face is always the same. Um, so this is this is the group of women that I work with. All of them um, have the same sentiments towards being a first year advisor as I do. We love our jobs a lot. We really love supporting you. Um, so never be shy to reach out to anyone for help. Um, so first and foremost, you always get me. You can always start with me with all your with all your questions. Um, but you know, for example, if you're someone who's really considering civil engineering, I would never hesitate to to steer you towards Karen for some of those bigger conversations. Um, and you could, you know, email her or, you know, have a video chat with her, um, set up an appointment with her. Um, all of them are very used to meeting with undeclared students who are trying to make a decision. Um, and what you can do is you can even meet with multiple of them and then come back to me and we can kind of, you know, puzzle piece it together so that we are fitting all the things you're interested in. Um, you know, I absolutely have students who love the environment, so they're interested in civil and environmental, 
but also really like computers, so they're interested in computer systems and electrical, and those majors are so different. Um, and the classes, you know, there's definitely some overlap, so you're very safe in your first semester. Um, but what you and I will do is we'll talk about the important classes, um, you know, after maybe you meet with Karen or Kara, uh, if you decide you want to do that. So it's kind of nice because you, as an undeclared student, kind of has a whole hub at your disposal while you're figuring out what you want to do. Um, so anyway, this is the team. Um, so this is where we're at right now when we're talking about registration for fall 2020. So first and foremost, we're your registration guides and the video chat which you're at right now. So we're checking that box today. Um, the next step is a one-on-one -on -one appointment. I am aware that my calendar is completely booked for the rest of this week and registration starts on Monday. Um, so that will be hard. However, I am answering my emails like a machine right now. Um, so, you know, if you do have questions, if you want to run your fall schedule past me, don't be shy to just send me an email. We can absolutely cover it in an email. And if, if it seems like we might need to have a bigger conversation, we'll work it out. Don't worry. Um, you know, it's, I'm here to help you out. And this is, this is the busy time of year. <laughs> um, and then after that, after you actually register on Monday, um, the next thing we'll do together is your student orientation. Um, so in the School of Engineering, we're going to do that in the middle of August. And that's where we're going to continue to give you um, support and Reese is all about, again, getting your feet on the ground before you get to RPI so that you know um, what to expect and, you know, tools to uh, help you be successful. Um, so that will be the next thing. And that's going to happen in this exact WebEx room. So you already know how that's going to work, which is nice. Um, and just so you know, if you haven't met with me yet on a one-on-one -on -one appointment, it's this room as well. Um, so hopefully, you know, I'm starting to feel really accessible to you. Uh, all right. So let's talk about our fall schedules. Okay, so I am gonna take a moment to talk about AP and other transfer credits. Um, yes, this is absolutely directed towards, um, you know, those of you who are planning to bring transfer credits. So we're going to take a moment to talk about that. But there's also really good information in here if you are, you know, you, you're thinking that part of what you want to do over the next four years is transfer credits to RPI. Um, you know, many students after their freshman year will actually um, do like classes at a community college, you know, just to keep busy over the summer or, you know, they want to move ahead a little bit more in their schedule. Um, so let's cover that quickly. Um, so I, I am aware and, uh, you know, the hub is aware that um, part of um, the challenges of this year's registration is that many of you will not actually get your AP scores before you register for classes. Um, what this means is that you, um, you're gonna have to go with your gut and we also call it an honor system. Um, and I will also tell you that every single year there is a reason why um, students for some reason don't get those AP scores. So this is something I'm very, very used to working with. So I know it's gonna be a stressor for you, but I promise it's not a stressor um, for me and I got your back on this one. <laughs> um, so this is something, if you wanna email me about it, we can talk about it um, and how you make these decisions. So the first thing you gotta think about is that in order to bring in an AP credit, you had to get a five. Um, so that shows that you have a very strong understanding of the material and that you should do you know, pretty well if you wanted to move on to the next level. You know, for example, skipping over Calculus 1 and starting with Calculus 2. Um, however, some students decide that they still want to start with Calculus 1 because they want to take advantage of, I feel really good about this material and I want to learn how to learn in college, so I'm going to do something that I feel confident in. 
that is certainly an acceptable way to approach your schedule. Um, some students, of course, want to move forward. Um, and whatever you decide, which is why it's kind of okay if you don't know your score, um, whatever you decide, there is flexibility. So if you, for example, want to, um, you know, you get into calculus two and you're like, oh man, this is way more challenging. I just want to take a step back. We can do that. It's not an issue at all. Um, and if you are someone who you go in calculus one, and you're like, ah, you know, I thought I wanted to start with something I know, but this is actually just a little too easy. I want to be more challenged. You know, we can make that change too. Sorry, I had a tickle in my throat. I'm doing a lot of talking lately. <clears throat> Um, so, um, ways to change your schedule. So first of all, registration opens on Monday, but it will stay open until July 22nd, which means there's a lot of time for you to get those scores in, connect with me and we can make a change right there. If you, you know, you get those scores and you instantly have a reaction to them about what you want to do. Um, if you don't, you know, if that's, if that's not the case for you, um, you can, um, wait until you get into the semester and we have something called the add deadline and the drop deadline. So that's that final check mark on this slide. Um, so the add deadline is the first two weeks of classes and this allows you to change sections. So again, that's that example where if you're in calculus two, but you really, you know, you realize that maybe I want to start in calculus one, what we'll do is we'll just, we'll find a section, we'll drop you out of calc two, we'll put you into calc one. And we can do that together, of course. Um, the drop deadline is really, really nice, um, and I actually refer to the add deadline and the drop deadline a lot as um, strategic planning, which comes into play when you're an undeclared engineer, because sometimes um, when you're trying to make a choice, you kind of have to play with the rules a little bit in order <laughs> to um, really find the schedule that makes the most sense for you. So the drop deadline is is a really fun um, useful thing to know about, especially when it comes to strategic planning, because if you drop a class before that drop deadline, it's like it never happened. You don't get a W on your transcript. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes we discover that, you know, we do actually really like the content, but we registered for too many courses, sometimes on purpose. We can talk about that later. Um, and we'll pick it up at a later time. You know, there's no, there's no negative, um, Actually, I shouldn't say that. There can be negatives who never drop a class without talking to me first, but when it comes to strategic planning, if you and I have a plan that involves the drop deadline, you know, there's there's a lot of positives that can come from that. Um, but that will help too, because you might discover, you know, you feel fine at first, but then you realize that you're really not doing as well as you thought in a class. Um, so you could switch over to, um, or you could drop a class. We won't be able to add anything else in at that point. Um, but you could drop a section that is just a little more challenging than you expected. Um, you and I will meet, of course, and talk about how that does impact your, your um, not only that semester, but future semesters, because it will, of course, have an impact. Um, but anyway, this is a really good, you know, this is one of those good conversations to have one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so um, going on about if you want to do community uh, credit. So this is bringing everyone else back in. Um, there is a process for that. If you go to the registration guide and you go to the AP section, you will see that there are actually, um, there are forms there that you can download and fill out. Um, so one of them, if you are someone who has community credits right now, is the high school form. And this one is just to certify that you did not use these credits for high school, which means we can take them at RPI. Um, so a principal or a guidance counselor will fill them out. Um, so that is only really going to happen right now. Um, the other form there is the transfer course um, or transfer credit approval form. Um, and I know I'm throwing a lot of words at you. I'm throwing a lot of information at you. If you go to that section, it's going to be very clear what I'm talking about because they're the only forms there. Um, but the second form, the transfer credit approval form, that is something that you will use from this day till graduation if you want to bring credits to RPI. Um, both of these forms, I can absolutely support you in filling out. Um, I think students are surprised at how straightforward some of that can be um, but you know don't you know don't hesitate to reach out to me if you if it's something you want to do um, and you just have a couple questions about it all right 
All right, let's talk about Haas. <laughs> so I just want to start with Haas and say that Haas is the number one question that I get um, when it comes to uh, making your, your plan. Um, so if you do have questions about Haas, definitely ask them today because you might be helping a lot of your peers. Um, so there's, there's a lot of requirements to Haas and typically because I know you guys get a lot, a lot of information, I only try to focus in on the ones that are, um, really pertinent to you right now. Um, and those are the ones on this slide where you see the star. So our Haas inquiry course, the communication intensive and our, and our Haas pathway. So that language should be really familiar to you when, when you went through the registration guide. Um, so for the most part, a hundred percent. What I want you to look at for the fall is your Haas inquiry course. It is something you can only take during your first year. You actually will be restricted from taking the Haas inquiry courses like IHSS courses once you hit your sophomore year. Um, so we can't miss that. Um, so I really encourage all of you to uh, take that Haas inquiry course in the fall and then you never have to think about it again. So that's first and foremost. Um, it is also awesome um, if that class is a communication intensive course, which is great if you are someone who doesn't really know what you want to do with your pathway yet, because um, then you can kind of just target those communication intensive courses um, and then get rid of that requirement. Um, however, if you if you have looked at the pathways and you do know what you're interested in, sometimes, you know, the first courses listed aren't necessarily communication intensive. Um, typically somewhere along the pathway, there is going to be one that's communication intensive, but remember that communication intensive requirement is in your first three semesters and that's there for a reason. Um, so, you know, in the past, seniors would be taking their communication intensive requirement course for Haas and then realized that what they were learning in that class as a senior would have been incredibly helpful to them um, for their four years of college. Um, so that is why the communication intensive requirement is now in the first three semesters because it's really there to help you um, be the best student that you can be during this time. Um, so, you know, those classes, of course, they're going to help you um, with your writing, they're going to help you with presentations, and if you think about all the labs you're going to do, and you'll definitely be doing presentations, um, it's, this class is here to help you. Um, all right, so when it comes to Haas, like I said, I get a lot of questions about it. These three things are the things that I'd like you to focus on for the fall. Um, in the future, in the fall, 100%, you and I are really going to map out your Haas requirements, we will fill out a worksheet together, one-on-one, um, -on -one, so you'll know exactly what you got to do and where you're at. Um, I can almost promise that whatever you take this fall for Haas is not going to be a mistake, um, and we can work with anything that you decide to do or you end up doing. Um, cool. All right, so let's go to that fall schedule. So keep in mind before I go anywhere that what we're about to talk about is the very general. So this is, these are all the safe classes. All the classes that we're about to talk about are either absolutely 100% a requirement of every single engineering degree, or they are 100% a requirement for like nine out of 10 degrees. I guess there's 11, so I should say nine out of 11 degrees. Um, and then they fit into a spot on um, the templates that are not directly requesting them. Um, so when in doubt, just stick with the basics here. Um, and, you know, if you are someone who you're looking at this and you're like, well, I really am interested in ECSE or I really am interested in etc. Um, that's where I'd say send me an email so that we can talk about where the flexibilities are so we can make sure you still are taking the classes you really need to and also getting in those courses um, that are going to be important for you making making a decision about your major. All right, so this should look really familiar to you from the registration guide. Um, so this is the thing that we will refer to for a while while you're trying to decide your major. It just keeps us on track. So even if we're looking at a bunch of other major templates, this is the thing that is saying, all right, these are the classes we really need to make sure that we're still taking, even if we want to add in a computer science course. Um, so for the fall, Crucial course is Engineering 1700, of course. You've heard me go on and on about this. Um, 
this class is so important for a lot of reasons. So first of all, every single week, oh, and this, this fall is actually going to be online, which is nice because it, it, it's just, you know, get into your dorm room, get yourself some popcorn and a cup of tea and sit back and listen to what the faculty have to say. Um, but every single week, every Monday, you're going to be introduced to a different engineering major. Um, so this is a great time to learn more about the majors that you uh, might not be that familiar with yet. Um, many students come to RPI having no clue what industrial and systems engineering is, industrial and management. Um, and then end up declaring it, you know, once they go through Engineering 1700. Um, students will have, think that they have a very strong idea of the major that they're interested in. Engineering 1700 will teach them that they didn't understand it the way they thought they understood it um, and realize it's not the major for them and also be able to find the major that's right for them within this course. Um, so it's a great class. Um, you know, the other thing about this class that I love is that it, it, it says it in the title, it's Better World Engineering. Um, so it does talk about with each of these engineering fields, you know, engineering mistakes in the past. Um, it's really helping you start to be a conscien conscientious engineer. Um, so, you know, how do we not repeat the past of the mistake that may have cost communities or cost lives? Um, and how do you, how do you, you know, go into the world and and make an impact um, with your um, your degree and your your um, passion for engineering. Um, so that is uh, introduction to better world engineering. And then after that class, we are still going to do the um, industry hour. That's going to be online too. Um, and you know, some of the benefits of doing it online are that we're going to be able to meet alumni from all over the nation and possibly all over the world, to be honest, um, who will, you know, the faculty are going to talk about the academics, they're going to talk about the curriculum. What's great about that is that you will get to meet faculty from every department. So if you are someone interested in research, you're already going to have names of people that you can reach out to to talk to them about it. It's a great networking class. Um, and then when the alumni come on, you're going to hear about the day to day of each of these jobs. So you can make sure that what you think the field is, it actually is. Um, and not to mention that, you know, it's kind of low states networking because you are a first year. Um, so you can really build relationships with these alumni just as you are figuring out what you want to what you want to major in. Right. Because you can just send them emails. They'll give you contact information. Um, you can send them emails to ask them questions about the degree. Um, mentorships do form um, from this kind of uh, networking. And then who knows when you're ready for an internship, maybe maybe they'll be able to help you find something in the future. Um, so th that's the crucial, right? You know, that's what we know as a as an undeclared engineer. We got to get engineering seventeen hundred on onto our curriculum. Um, the math and science core, you know, we we definitely talk about in the registration guide. Um, you know, and uh, you got to do your Haas class. So you're going to be at 18 credits, probably 17 or 18 credits by the time you put your schedule together. Um, I know sometimes students have a little bit of a concern about that because it seems like a very high number. Um, you know, one thing that I'll always say is that I think one thing that um, a lot of people don't realize is that at RPI, our classes are four credits at other schools, the same like the physics one is is a three credit course. So the numbers just play out a little bit differently when you look at it like that. Um, but also, you know, keep in mind that these are the classes that are really getting you started as an engineer here. Um, you know, physics and calculus are definitely prerequisites for courses that are headed your way. Um, and chemistry, depending upon the major you're interested in, can also be a prerequisite for courses that are headed your way. Um, the Haas class is, it's a great class because it gives you a bit of a brain break. Um, it allows you to, um, you know, I like it because it kind of echoes what you're doing in um, high school where you have the math and science mixed with those humanities classes um, but also you know it, it makes sure that you're not your schedule isn't weighed down by math and science classes and it gives you four credits to keep you where you need to be um, without it being another heavy math and science course um, introduction to better world engineering and your one 
credit exploratory course, so one of the orange classes, those are seminars, so those aren't going to be work intensive. You know, there might be a little bit of homework, but nothing that you can't handle. Um, so it really comes down to, you know, these, you know, your, your math and science courses. Um, all right, so let me move on from that to get us some more bullet points. So this kind of is another breakdown of everything we just went over. Um, I just want to remind everyone for the math course, um, you will not see multivariable calculus listed here, and that is because it is not a requirement for all engineering degrees. So as often as I can help you um, steer away from classes that you might not end up using, at, you know, once you declare your major, I, I do that. Um, However, if you're looking at major templates and you see that every major you're interested in does require a multivariable calculus, of course it is an option for you, um, which again goes into the, that's why I like the one-on-one -on -one conversation so that we can make those calls. Um, and then I did send an email about this yesterday um, with your Physics 1. So I know many of you should be registering for Physics 1. You will also need to register for Physics 1960. Um, this is not another class. It's actually just an extension of Physics. Um, you just have to register for it. And it's a mentoring section. So it's actually there to help you um, do the homework and do the work that you're going to be doing in physics one. Um, so don't let that stress you out. It's just something that you have to add when you add uh, physics 1100. All right. For the rest of this, hopefully, you know, you're feeling really confident about it right now. Um, oh, I just want to go back to the one credit exploratory courses. I just... I like to draw attention to the fact that some are fall only and some are spring only. So for the fall, materials and chemical engineering, those are the two one credit seminars um, that you have the option to take, which means if you don't, if you're interested in these majors, but you don't take them this fall, you're going to have to wait until your sophomore year to take them, um, which by that point could make them less helpful in making a decision about your major, um, you know, because you might already have a decision so just keep that in mind um you can pick up engineering processes and industrial and systems uh, engineering anytime so you could take those in the spring if you wanted to um and then of course there are the three that are we're not even going to talk about them until later because you're not going to be able to look at them until the spring semester anyway so make a decision about materials and chemical engineering um with the one credit seminar um again something i'm here to help with Okay, so registration begins in a few days on July 13th, next Monday. Um, how to be successful. So you all have time tickets now, so you can find those time tickets in SIS, your student information system. If you're not sure exactly where that is, uh, it is laid out for you in the registration guide. You'll find that in the how to register section. I totally encourage you to reread the how to register section. Um, so that you can, um, you know, just feel confident about Monday and knowing what's going to happen when you sit down. Um, when you get that time ticket, when you look at the time you're going to register, make sure that time is on your calendar, set a notification, and you want to be sitting down ready to register at that exact moment. Um, because the longer you wait to do it, the you might not get the, the plan A that you create in yaks or quacks. Um, and then, of course, you know, I am someone who is all about having multiple plans. I really want you to have more than one plan when you sit down on Monday. So use YAKS to make a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, um, and write down, write down those CRNs so that you know, you know, if you, if you go to register for classes and something is full, all you have to do is plug in a new number. Keep it that simple. Um, if, and if something is full, just move on to your plan B. Keep it, keep it simple, right? Okay. Um, registration challenges. So classes might be full. They might be restricted to a major. Um, they might have a prereq or a prorec that you need, or you're asked to join a wait list. So for all of these, I'd say in the moment, move straight to your plan B, just register for another course. Um, and then you could email me. If a class is full, that might be hard, you know, to get you into. Um, but what happens between your registration and the first couple weeks of classes is that students are constantly adding and dropping classes. So just because a class is full when you go to register for it, it doesn't mean that you're not going to ultimately end up in that class. Um, it's just keeping an eye on the seats. Um, if a, if a 
classes are restricted to a major, which does happen with Haas courses. Um, what that means is that they are letting students in the major declare those classes before they open it up to the general um, student population. Um, so this in some instances means that they might open up all those classes once the term starts. So you could get into like the, the you know, GSAS class that you're interested in, um, the, the computer games and simulation. Um, it also might mean that all the students in that major have taken all the seats in that class and it, it will be unlikely that you get into that class. Um, sometimes what students will do, you know, to make sure that they can get into those courses is they'll declare a minor in those um, areas where it is tougher to get in um, because then you will be part of that restricted to major um, area. So if that's something, you know, if you're seriously considering, you know, a, a minor in something like the, the games and simulation, um, let me know and we can talk about it. Um, classes might have prereqs and corecs that you need. So this is actually kind of, I'm just putting this bullet point in here for the future. For this particular registration, they're actually going to turn off all prereqs and corecs because of the fact that not all students will have received, you know, your, your AP scores. You know, I know students right now are trying to figure out, you know, for the first time doing that process of bringing in um, community college credits. So, you know, they, they don't have those turned on. So they that's the honor system again. Um, of course, if the prereqs don't work out, you might be kicked out of a class <laughs> if you're if you're in a class. Um, so we'll pay attention to that for sure. Um, and then uh, but in the future, you know, for example, if you don't get your AP Calculus 1 credit in, you know, something happens with that, you will not be able to register for some courses. Um, so that is something to always keep in mind, and that's why we always keep peeking to make sure that the credits are there that we think should be there. Um, if you're asked to join a waitlist, this can happen with many classes, a lot of engineering courses. Uh, join. For sure, join, especially if it's the section you want to be in. Um, sometimes this will happen with engineering processes because it is such a fun class that a lot of students go for it. Um, if you are um, on the wait list, that means they'll kind of go through and, you know, as a student drops a class, they'll offer it to the next student in line. Um, or, you know, sometimes depending upon how big the wait list is, they, they'll try to add in a, a whole other section. Um, so always join a wait list and then always pay attention to your email to see if they are offering um, you the chance to join the class. So you'll want to check your check your email every single day. Start those habits now. I know your email is a huge thing. I know you get a lot of stuff, um, but if you start building the habits now with like maybe an hour in the morning and an hour at night, you're gonna be happy about that by the time you, you join us on campus. Okay, um, more registration challenges. You get locked out assist. You never received a time ticket. Um, says that you need a prereq or co-rec that you do have. So we kind of covered that already. Again, it's just, I wanna bring awareness to that. Um, you know, because in the future, it'll definitely um, potentially come up if you're bringing in stuff. Um, if you don't see a time ticket in SIS, so in SIS, you're going to look at register at a drop. It should be right there if for whatever reason you don't see something um, or if you get locked out of SIS, this is the email address that you want to email. So it's new student reg at rpi.edu. Um, you know, I am always here to help you, but in this case, time is of the essence. So I want to make sure that you cut me out as your middleman and you go straight to the source. So this is the email address that the registrar's office has set up in order to help you as incoming first year students register for your classes. So this is for, you know, think of them as technical support. Um, so if there's any, like anything that comes up that you, you don't understand with your SIS account, um, or if you can't do something that you think you should be able to do, just email them um, and they, they'll help you out. Um, and you can always copy me in on those emails if you want to. Um, it's, it's good because it keeps me in the loop of what you might be struggling with. Um, and also if I can jump in to support you even more, absolutely I will. But these are, these are the people that you want to know. Okay. All right, so let's talk about registration resources. So these are the tools. So the registration guide is a beautiful big document that is here to help you with this registration and registration in the future. For Monday, here are the things that I want to make sure that you feel confident about. 
So we're kind of breaking down that guide a little bit. So first of all, know about the guides. <laughs> um, because the guides are going to answer a lot of your questions. Um, you know, I would say there's loads of time to re-review the guides if you're not feeling sure that you know what's in them. Take it a section at a time. You know, you do not have to read that whole thing at once. Um, you know, I, you know, skip over the section about the hub because I think you're probably feeling good about that right now. But like really reread that, you know, planning your fall semester, reread the, um, you know, how to how to register section. Um, you know, just, just take it slow. You have a lot of time between now and Monday to go through it. Um, and then we have Yaks and Quacks. So these are the two tools, um, to help you plan a schedule. Um, I actually pulled up Yaks earlier and it did load for me. So I wanted to, oops, I wanted to, uh, hold on. I wanted to pull it up. So let me quickly, um, I want to share my web browser. Okay. So <clears throat> you, sh you should now see um, Yaks. Um, so this is Yaks. So if you watched the video, you definitely got a good run through it. Um, but it is, it is a great tool um, to help you plan schedules. It's much better than the old school pen and paper, which you used to have to do. Um, it breaks it down in a really nice way, too. So you can see, like, these are your Haas courses. So you can kind of see all those options you have for Haas. Of course, this is where I want you to hang out for your fall semester in this um, IHSS section. Um, when we drop the arrow down, right now you're going to see um, there's full sections. The sections are not actually full right now. Uh, they are currently saving seats for you as incoming students, so those will open up. You'll see how many seats are in them um, soon, I imagine. Um, so don't ignore the full sections right now. <laughs> um, going back to Yaks, uh, over here we'll see our science. So there's our chemistry, there's our math, there's our physics. But you can also see all the other science classes. Um, we're going to not really look at most of these um, for your fall semester, but in the future they might be things that we need to take into consideration. Again, some of you might really need to be taking computer science in the fall. And then here's all our engineering courses. So you can see some of them are specific to the major. Um, core engineering is where you're going to find the things that are for everyone, like engineering processes, um, you know, uh, engineering analysis. Um, but what I really like is that right up here in the search bar, you could actually just type in exactly what you know you have to take and you get to those sections. Um, so if you click on them like that, you are, you've just selected all of these sections. If we go to schedule, we'll see them here um, and the arrow will walk us through them this bar, you pull it out and you'll see what's there. Um, so you can see oh, in moments <clears throat> I can build the engineering schedule that you and I are discussing um, and come up with plan, plan A's, plan B's, um, and feel, you know, like you have a good idea of what, oh, here we go, um, of what you need to be doing for the fall. So let me do that just so I can kind of show you. No, Yax is slowing down on me. Come on. Come on, Yax. Well, I was so happy with it. <laughs> so we all know Yax has had some trouble. So if you look over here, this is Quacks. I just moved screens. It looks almost exactly the same. It works almost exactly the same. Um, so whichever one is working for you, use that one. All right, so if we go to Core Engineering, um, we will see, let's see. Well, let's click on Processes, because I think a lot of you might end up there. And then we have our Better World Engineering. So if we go to Schedule, um, hopefully this will load. Um, I know it definitely has not worked as well as it has in the past. Um, but like I said, these tools are here. Um, sometimes you just have to give them a chance. Um, so here we can see there's a thousand schedule options. So if you come over here, you can start, um, you can start selecting different sections, right? So if you're like, oh, well, you know, I don't really want to take a 9am class. 
you know, you can, you can knock that out. Um, with physics one, you know, maybe, maybe you have a friend that you want to take the class with. So you knock out all of these, except for the one section that you guys are going to do together. Um, you know, and every time you do that, it's going to change the number here, which is nice because the less options you have, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the easier it is to maybe make a schedule. But hopefully this shows you how easy it is to have multiple plans um, for your for your fall schedule. So you'll just go through like this. Um, and the number that you need to register is this one. So it's the one that starts with a two. So that's what we call the CRN, which is the course registration number. So this is the number that you are going to plug into your student information system. You're going to plug it right into SIS. Um, so get a piece of paper, write those numbers down, um, open up a Word document or a notepad and write those numbers down um, and keep it, keep it simple. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my web browser. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Well, let's present. Ah, oh, shit. Okay. Too far. Okay. So then SIS, of course, we know is our student information system. So that is the tool that we're actually going to register for classes. So the register add drop area is going to be really important to you and sis and the class search is going to be really important to you and sis. So make sure you know where both are in the student venue. Make sure, make sure you're comfortable with both of those. Um, you will not be able to see anything other than your time ticket when you click register add or drop right now. But as soon as your time ticket opens up, it's going to look very different. Um, and you're going to see how easy it is to register for your courses. Um, and this is also where I say every time you learn something new, you know, there there is going to be a learning curve. So just because I'm saying it's simple, it does not mean you're not going to have questions about it, um, which is totally fine and totally fair. I truly believe there's no such thing as a silly question when you're learning. Um, so if you do kind of get stumped on it, let me know. Um, and then I guess that leads into your academic advisor. Know the person that you can go to for help when you don't really see, feel like you are confident in what's going on. Um, send me emails. Um, like I said, I know my calendar is booked for the rest of the week, but I, I'm happy to respond to emails from you. Um, you know, if you have questions about the fall schedule and then also for the first time, um, because of COVID, you know, we're doing a lot more online stuff. So I'm going to try to do a bit of a walk-in situation on Monday so that I'm available to everyone as you're going into registration for the first time. Um, so this link, this room, this WebEx room that we're in right now, um, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to um, connect with me if you do run, run into some trouble. Those, that's going to be for really short conversations. Um, unfortunately, I want to make sure I'm available to everyone. So if you do realize that the problem involves blowing up your whole schedule and starting again, I'd say immediately make an appointment with me um, and we'll we'll fix it later in the week it should be okay um, definitely register for something at the time of your time ticket um, but we'll, we'll we'll work together to fix it um, but for quick questions you know if you you can't find something you thought you could find or you just want to make sure that you understand what happens when you hit submit those kind of things um, hopefully uh, this new thing I'm gonna try with walk-ins will will work um, okay all right, so let's switch gears and switch it over to time for questions. Um, as I just said, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a silly question when you're learning. Um, so, you know, you can send me questions in the chat room privately, so not everyone sees them. I won't see your name when I read the question out loud. Um, and, you know, or you can send the question to everyone, which is also fine, whatever you're most comfortable with. So let me stop sharing for now so you can see me as I answer questions. All right, I will give everyone a couple minutes to type their questions in.
Okay. I guess everyone's feeling super confident for Monday. <laughs> I'm not getting any. Oh, I just got a question. Um, yep. So if you have an AP score of five and want to take the next class, do you just register for the next class, even though the scores may not be sent? Yes, absolutely. That is how you'll do it on Monday. Um, so that goes back to like the honor code. You know, if you if you're pretty positive you're going to get a five and you want to move up, just move up. And then if anything happens, you know, if you get a four and you didn't um, expect that, that's where I come in and then you and I can make the changes together. But yes, on Monday, register for what what you think you you have. Good question. Okay, any other questions out there? Yep, okay. So the one-on-one -on -one will be for going over mock schedules slash possible interest. Yes. So um, in a one-on-one, -on -one, it's a really good time for you to tell me what majors you're interested in um, because I can tell you, you know, what classes we really want to pay attention to for the fall semester. Um, you know, and I, I know I keep talking about computer science, but it's a really good example if you are someone who's thinking about the ECSE majors. You know, I don't include computer science in that fall semester because most engineering majors don't have that specific requirement. Uh, but it is, it is an important class if you are interested in electrical um, engineering or, you know, even more so the computer systems engineering. Um, there is flexibility, so just so everyone feels comfortable. So if you didn't take computer science until the spring, it is okay. Um, but it's definitely one of those classes that helps you make a decision about your major. Um, and of course, every major has its own little, um, like, nuances that you will learn as you as you go through. So like, you know, civil engineering has them, uh, mechanical engineering has them. So if you know what you think you're interested in, and you don't have to, by the way, I, a couple of students I met with this week listed like five or six different majors, which is totally no normal at this point. Um, but if you're narrowing in, you know, we can talk about those nuances and see if there's an adjustment that you want to make to the fall, um, just for you, just, just so that it makes sense for you. Okay. All right. I'm definitely getting some more questions right now, so give me two seconds so I can read through them, and then I'll say them out loud. Oh, this is a really good question. Um, so, a student who took Calculus 1 their junior year and got a 4, um, senior year took Calculus 2, and if they get a five on the calculus two exam, would they be able to skip to calculus three? So this is, so everything about your um, curriculum requirements is a numbers game. Um, so if you skip over four credits, it means that you still owe four credits if you don't bring those credits in with you. Um, so I would say this is definitely an interesting situation. It's certainly one that happens occasionally. Um, so I would say send me an email so we can work it out together, but it probably, if you're not bringing in the calculus one credit, it is something we're going to have to take. There's a way to quote unquote test out, but you still again are going to owe four credits. Um, so that typically means that you're going to take a more advanced math course at the end of your normal engineering requirements. So you would take something beyond um, like differential equations, you know, and depending upon the major you're choosing, it would even be beyond like multivariable calculus. Um, so it's, that's a really good question. So why don't you email me and we'll, we'll work on that one together. Um, next question. Oh, I love this question. Um, can you take multiple engineering electives or is it better to take it slow and leave seats for other people? So this one is a totally personal decision and I am on board with whatever you decide. Um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about, uh, the drop deadline and strategic planning. Um, some students truly are genuinely interested in like material science or chemical engineering um they also find you know like processes exciting and fun and they want to take that um i get it especially when you're coming into your first semester there's so many options um so i i totally understand why you might be considering more than one 
Um, what I would say is I never want you to overload yourself in your first semester because there's much more than just classes that you're going to be transitioning to um, when you come to RPI. Um, but, you know, you know, one thing that you could do, and sometimes I even recommend, is register for what you're interested in. Um, and then know that you're going to drop some of them <laughs> and I'll make you promise me that you'll drop some of them. Um, so that way you don't overwhelm yourself, but then you can figure out which classes you actually want to dedicate yourself to for the fall semester. Um, some students can figure it out in the first class, first couple weeks. Some students will take a little bit longer to decide. Um, but I would say if you're, if you're someone who's like, I, and I, you know, there is, there is a definite relationship between materials engineering and chemical engineering. So I understand if you're interested in both of those. Um, and the other thing that I'll say and remind you is that Engineering 1700 is going to give you a dose of everything. Um, of course, it's not going to be a whole semester focused on one major, but you're going to still meet, you know, that department and get information from them. Um, so if you find yourself, you know, not wanting to overwhelm yourself, know that you're still going to have those opportunities just in a, a smaller amount. Um, that's a great question, though. Um, something, you know, maybe email me and tell me which ones you're interested in and, and I can, I can give you a little more information on it. Okay. So, the next question, sorry, I'm trying to, are yaks and quacks used to help create mock set schedules? Yes, absolutely. That is what they're there for. Um, both of them are actually, um, created and maintained and managed by student groups on campus, which is really cool because who knows what a student needs better than a student. Um, so that's why I don't really get the updates on what's happening with them. Um, but they are they are really nice tools. I know that they haven't been giving themselves a good <laughs> a good show right now, but I promise that you're gonna you're gonna fall in love with them. Um, they they pull information directly from SIS, so that way that's why you can see the classes that are available in the fall. Um, the one thing that I don't think I ever say enough is during registration, so on Monday, uh, both YAKS and QUACS will not have the right number of seats, which is why we always recommend splitting your screen and putting like YAKS on one side and SIS on the other. SIS will always have the right number of seats, but if you think about it, a time ticket goes off at 8 a.m., right? everyone's jumping in, registering for courses, they're adding and dropping classes. There is no way that even with a millisecond lag time, yaks or um, quacks can keep up with that. Um, so SIS is always going to have the right number of seats. So that's what you wanna check um, when, you're, when you're going to register. Good question. Okay, next question. Okay, when creating our mock schedules on yaks or quacks, by the way, I, I just love that they're called yaks and quacks. Anyway, <laughs> um, when creating our mock schedules on yaks or quacks, how many CRNs do you typically recommend taking note of before registering for classes to ensure each course preference is not full? So I, I think if you do a, like a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C, that should be good. You know, three different sections. Um, you want to make sure that they, they play well together. You know, these, these sections fit in together. Um, I think that should be enough. Um, you know, keep in mind that while all en all engineering students are going to be looking at like similar courses to you, like the math and science courses, all students are going to be looking at the Haas classes, you know, all incoming first year students have to pick those IHSSs. Um, so you really want to make sure that you do have a few plans. Um, it, you're gonna, you're gonna get what you need, um, even if it looks a little bit different than you planned or expected to. Um, but yeah, I, I think a plan A, B, and C should be enough. Um, that's a good question. Okay. Are there any other questions out there? I'm happy to hold on for another moment. Okay, we got another one. 
do you know how many classes will be on campus? This is a very good question. Um, so of course we'll, um, oh, and, and add on with how, versus how many classes will be online. So with COVID, you know, being in a international health, health pandemic is very interesting, right? Um, it, it means that everyone's making plans right now but we don't know what tomorrow will bring, right? So that's one of the reasons why you get me because I can absolutely be that point person on campus as everything is um, kind of working itself out. So I don't want any of you to feel stressed or overwhelmed by this. I know you are, um, but I want you to know that you have me um, to help you figure out everything as we move forward. Right now, um, it is my understanding the faculty are still kind of um, putting everything together. Um, for the fall, but I, I believe that pretty much everything that you guys are going to be doing as first years is going to work out to be um, majoritively in person. Um, so what this means is they might do smaller sections, and I did see someone ask me um, to define what I mean by sections, so I'll do that now too. Um, sections is, so in calculus, you know, you have, calculus is your course, but then there's multiple, um, what we call sections. So like, you could be, um, I was gonna, I can show you. Let me pull it back up in Yax. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll continue answering that question too, don't worry. Um, all right, so each of these, under Physics 1, each of these is a different section. So for example, this would be Section 4, this would be Section 8. So it's kind of the breakdown of each of the courses. So I know what, what is happening is that they are making smaller sections or they're creating like a rotation schedule. So, you know, if we look at, and these are just examples, do not take what I'm saying as set in stone for the fall um, because I don't I don't have that information right now uh, but for example you know with this calculus one class being on a Monday and a Thursday what they might be doing is some of you will report on Mondays and some of you will report on Thursdays um, you know for labs I think that they're gonna make sure that it's broken up because you you're gonna want to do your labs in person so there might be smaller groups um, and of course we're gonna keep everyone safe by wearing the masks um, during class and walking around campus um, so I, I know that there's a lot of uncertainty with this right now um, so please keep your questions coming about it I am incredibly transparent. If I know something, you will know it. If I don't know something, I'll let you know that I don't. Um, and I just I just want you to all keep in mind that um, RPI has definitely got a hand in the COVID um, stuff. Of course, you know, we're a campus of super brilliant faculty and students. So there's a lot of people who are working on it um, as a as a general, <laughs> like, um, you know, to help to help out the country a little bit, um, but also in terms of figuring out what our fall will look like. Um, but, you know, as first year students, you will definitely be um, in person for a majority of your classes from my understanding right now. Um, Engineering 1700, like I said, will be online. Some of your seminars might be online, but that's just because they're really big classes. And the goal of a seminar is to kind of be like a nice dose of information without overwhelming you. So, you know, some of those classes will, will not be in person. But engineering processes will absolutely be in person. Um, I think that's one of the classes where they're going to have smaller sections, um, you know, because that's the class where you're getting your hands dirty, right? You're in the shop and you're building things. So you can't do that online. Um, so it's a good question. It is a good question. Um, and I know, you know, the answers are coming. All right, let me stop sharing this. Okay. And hopefully I answer that question well enough for right now. I know there's uncertainty. Um, any other questions out there? Okay, looks like we might be at the end of our Q&A time. Um, so just as a reminder, um, I am here to help you as you are working out all of this stuff. Um, I am easy to access with a quick email, you know, um, again, 
I don't think I have any openings for appointments for the rest of the week, but I am going to be checking my email and I will answer every single email I get before Monday. Um, so that way you have the answers to your questions. So don't be shy if you need me. Um, the next things to think about, of course, I would love to meet all of you in the next couple weeks, regardless of the fact that registration happens on Monday. I'd still like to kind of connect with you. Um, next up is student orientation. So you'll hear from me in a couple, well, maybe next week, maybe the week after. Um, I haven't written the email yet about student orientation. Um, but we'll we'll connect again to kind of continue to get you acclimated to being part of our Rensselaer community. Um, and I'll talk to you more about what the hidden curriculum means, which is basically those pro tips from the hub and students to help get your feet under you in your first year. Um, please remember to check your email every day and answer those emails um, because there's a lot of information coming at you right now. I don't want you to get overwhelmed, and if you just tackle it a little bit every day, um, you you will be able to get through it, I promise. Um, everyone just wants to make sure that you you know what's going on, especially, you know, especially because you're new to Rensselaer, you know, we want to make sure that you know what's going on, but with the COVID stuff, you know, we want to, we don't want anyone to feel like they are left out of the loop um, and not hearing what they need to hear right now. So make sure you're checking that email. And if you're not hearing something that you think you should be hearing, that's what you have me for. So email me and I will figure out some answers for you. All right, I'm gonna leave it there for today. It was really great talking to everyone. Um, good questions and I look forward to working with you um, from now until you declare your major. <laughs> All right, bye. Thank <laughs> you.